Mission Historic Places, you're going to get to see my brother Stephen and I take on not a mighty river, but the combined Agawam and West Springfield Historical Societies filled with fired up senior citizens who want to learn something about their local river system, a little bit of history, and natural history as well. So we decided to do something different. We gave a lecture. We have, we've lectured for years, he and I. He on, uh, you know, birds and biology and me on history. And we've done it all over New England. But in this case, we did a combined lecture. And we got uh, a couple of former students to fill in on the cameras. Uh, and we're going to be bringing this to you. We hope you enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, you can just fast forward it or choose not to watch it. But it's some interesting stuff. We're taking a look at the history of the Westfield River, both uh, human history and natural history. So, check it out. Decided to do a trip down the Westfield River from the entering Westfield sign, so right on the border, from there down to the confluence with the Connecticut River. Which now the Westfield River, huh? We should be clear. He said, hey, this would be great, let's do this. He's very agreeable. He knew, being a bird guy, he is actually known around the Northeast for guiding these bird tours, if you like birds. If you want to know anything about birds, call him. His, I'll give you his email later. You can email him, you can call him. He's a big bird guy. Big fan of birds. But anyways, he was all more than willing because he'd get a chance to see the wildlife. And I've always been, he and I both love natural history, and adventure. And adventure and history, and we were going to bring, of course, we brought the fishing poles. We had a, you'll see in a little while. But the idea was we were going to videotape this because growing up in West Springfield, I was always down at the West Hill River. I was a river rat. You know, I'd be down there after school going fishing, running around and having a good time, swimming. You know, you're not supposed to always swim down there, but we were always down there. And I remember thinking years and years ago that. That river is such a treasure, and West Central doesn't even know it's there. I mean, but we made the video, got a lot of film, and uh, so here's us. We tried to dress in the exact clothing, the clothing that we wore that we're wearing now. We wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got the. I brought the paddle. I want to be. Upper, you don't want to be up a presentation without a paddle. <laughs> so we brought the paddle. <laughs> See? How was that? So the idea, you know, is we're going down the river. Now, people from Agawam might remember that the Westfield River has two names. Above the entering Westfield site, it was called the Westfield River. But from the border of Westfield and Westside, it becomes the Agawam River until it enters the Connecticut River. In fact, it appears on maps that way, which is an interesting little tidbit. The other problem is Massachusetts has another Agawam River out east in Ipswich, and they have two Amerindian tribes called Agawams. Our Agawams, who William Pension met in 1635, and the Agawams out there in Ipswich. Who knew? Who would have thought it? Rich, you can give it a click. So what I did, because we didn't have a Comcast channel, is I made the videos and I put them on my YouTube channel, which is called Fishing Historic Places, which is where I go to different places all over the Northeast, like Lake George or whatever. And I talk about the history of the area, and then I catch some fish. So it's a fun YouTube channel that I created. And we made this video Originally for Comcast, I put it up on Fish and Historic Places. You can give it another click, right? The, the best episodes have been in my life. Yeah, he's in, he's in a few of them. So Massachusetts, and we are right here. And I put this map up because it's really cool to understand that Massachusetts has got, you know, if you think about the Northeast, the Northeast is some of the most interesting geological, uh, if, you, if you're into geology, the Northeast is one of the coolest places in the country to live. Because it's got, oh, I'm not going to get into it crazily, but I will tell you that where we are, you all know about the dinosaur tracks that have been found all over our area. Where you see that green, that's called Triassic Rock, right? It's from the Mesozoic period of Triassic period. And it is 200 to 250 million year old rock. And it's 
sediment. It's just, it's great stuff. And that's why we've got the, he was just telling me that he found some uh, ripple marks that you will find all over the place. In fact, when, if you look in the gorge between West Springfield and Agawam along the Nicknag Bridge, there's ripple marks all over those rocks that are fossilized ripple marks. And I guarantee you that if you played around down there for a little while, you'd probably find some dinosaur tracks because they're all over. And you guys have probably been to the ones in Olio. Any place you find shell? All over. And this line right there, the seven systems, right? The oh. mountains that it's extend seven. over the top. Uh, I started a little early. And then down that big bridge, minutes. that's volcanic yes. rock that's only about 60 million years old. Just in our area, that's some interesting stuff going on geologically. So in our trip, we literally start at that 60 million year old rock. When you're driving into Westfield, and you're going by that entering Westfield site, on the right side of you is East Mountain, and on the left side of you is the ridge that continues all the way down into Connecticut. And that is formerly, well it's, it's basalt right now, and it's 60 million, 60, 60 million year old lava that hardened up. So our trip starts there and it moves down to the Connecticut River. And what's cool about the Westfield, if, um, I got maps coming, up above the Westfield comes through a series of rocks that is even older. The Taconic Range is new, but then in this area, this rock here in the Berkshires is about a billion to a billion and a half year old rock. If you want to find garnets, precious stones, all you have to do is walk in the Westfield River. If you walk in the Westfield River for a half an hour, and you know what you're looking for, here's what you're looking for, a rock with little pimples on it. You pick the rock up out of the water and wash it, and you'll see little garnets. Tiny little ones, ones as big as your pinky finger. I just found one last week with garnets as big as my thumbnail, and I left it in my classroom. I bring it into the kitchen. Oh, man. I know, huh? Give it a click, right? So here's an elevation map of West Springfield and Adelaide. And the reason I start here is we're going to start with human history, human and natural history, right? So we think about human history. Where do the Amerindian people live? when they meet the Europe. When William Pension, the, the guy who established the Springfield, comes up the river with the wave of English settlers. I mean, this area we live in is one of the oldest. I always tell the kids, you live in one of the oldest places that has been settled uh, by English in North America. And this, this is, if you go down to where we have all the shops, the real shops, that's up. you see it's all flat. And yes. when you go up the hill, you can see flattened up, plateaus out. Yeah, you can either side, because right, yeah. this is the remnants of what's called Glacial Lake Hitchcock. Glacial Lake Hitchcock. Lake in Vermont, and all the way down to Huge Hitchcock. Glacial Lake that broke in stages. Right, so when that broke, that's when you had the dinosaurs walking around in the, in the sludge and left their footprints, got covered up and turned into dinosaur footprints. And you can see the last lake bottom and then the earlier lake bottom, right? and then what were probably islands, because it extended all the way to the Berkshires. Yep, so it's kind of cool. But elevation-wise, West Springfield's average elevation is 65 feet above sea level, and the highest spot in West Springfield is up by Prospect Down, it's like 200 and something feet above sea level. So we're not really that high above sea level. The Westfield River cuts into the Connecticut River Basin, and I'm talking about this whole sea level thing because our Amerindians were riverine people. They liked the rivers. The rivers provided roads for them. They also provided refrigerators for them. There, you need food, especially after the starving time. The starving time is February, March, and into April. You can't wait for these leaves to start to poke on the trees because that means up the river are coming huge fish, shad, salmon, massive numbers of herring and owlwives are coming up the river. And they're coming up the river right now. Not to mention all the herbs in the, in the forest picking up. So right, so you got your forageable herbs. So you're going to click, right? So we're going to click through some maps real quick. Here's our Puritans showing up. And you can see the pension colony established here in 1635. Originally in Agawam, kind of close to the hood plant down there, just a small settlement. And then the Agawams asked them if you could please go to the other side of the river because the pigs and the cattle were getting into the corn and messing things up. So they went to the other side of the river. Give it another quick bridge. 
So again, I don't know. I get, I'm into maps. I put a lot of maps up. So you can see the settlement pattern along the way up the up the river. We, the early English who came to North America, were also, as the Amerindians, riverine, right? They used the rivers to as roads to follow uh, inland from the ocean. Give it another clip. And here's one of our great old maps uh, on the Library of Congress site. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on it. But before we zoom in on it, notice that notch right there? There's the original Springfield land grant marked on the map. West uh, uh, Springfield, the pension purchased from, from the Indians, and I'm going to show you the deed in a minute, extended south into Connecticut, Southfield, Enfield, part of Summers, was in that original Springfield land grant, which a lot of people don't know. Give it a click. There it is again, you can see it. One more click, and we're starting to zoom in, and another click, you're gonna get bored with maps, so we'll just keep playing. There he is, William Pension, the founder of the feast. And he comes up the river in 1635, and he was a crafty guy. He was from out by Boston, he was from Roxbury. Roxbury. And he, uh, he had a plan, you know how Boston back in the day was on a peninsula? He had a plan where he wanted to buy up all the land on that peninsula and put up a toll booth so that he could basically make all the money from all the trade that was going into Boston. I like to say Boston, but a Boston accent. Is that how they talk about things? That's what I heard. I don't know. Uh, I, I, <laughs> shall I compare thee to a summer's day? How That's how they are that? bought out our small parents. So this good, uh, uh, good, uh, good, uh, good, uh, good sir, uh, Mr. Pension, came in on that with his, give it a quick race like, I'm losing. So we got the, the deed here. Here's our deed, the original deed and the translation. And Pension ends up grabbing a huge chunk of land. He gets Holyoke, West Springfield, Agawam, Southwick, a little bit of Westfield. I go all the way around and East Long Meadow, Long Meadow, Summers, Enfield, Chicopee, Springfield, Partahan, and Wilbraham. Ludwall, big area of land. What does he pay for? He pays 18 fathom of wampum, which is beads. He pays 18 shovels, 18 blankets, 18 hoes, which are for digging in the ground, 18 axes, and 18 cooking pots. And he gets all that land. And of course, he's supposed to share it. And here are the Amerindian chiefs. The Agawam chiefs made their marks on that document. This is all readily available. You can, you can get it online. You can get it at the probate court. Give it another quick race. So we're getting closer. Our map is getting closer. So you can see our Westfield River pension decides to settle where he settles because of the confluence of the Chicopee River here and the Westfield River here. And these rivers provide access to the hinterlands. Pension, wanted to make money in Boston, and the people in Boston didn't like his plan. He figured he'd start his own ball game out here, and the idea would be make good relations with the Amerindians, and they would do his trapping and his furring for him. So the major mammals, and I was gonna have you add the mammals, but I forgot. We Man, son of a gun. We got the beaver, we got the muskrat, the otter, right? At a time you have wolves, Mount Lyons. Tons of wolves. You had a thing called. Think about the wolves. They had a wolf bounty in Massachusetts right till the early 18th century. There were so many wolves. Eastern Mount Lion. Wow. You had, you had uh, Eastern Caribou, which is now gone. It's like Eastern yep. Mount Lion. Oh, we pay. And you had an animal that is no longer in existence. It was called the Sea Mink. It was much like the Sea Otter out west, only it was a mink that lived in the water. So uh, much larger than our current men. Yeah, and so gone, gone. How many of you guys have seen mink in West Springfield? See them in the low light conditions. If you have a brook near your house, my brother lives on Eli Out, not this brother, the other brother. And that little brook, you see this little black, you might think it's a black squirrel if you look real quick. But it's long. Long, long and thin. I saw the, 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 the weasel family so, yesterday. Yep. There, there you go. go. The line. There you yep. go. And that's a good place for them because there's the little brooks that are coming. Any place you see water. That's a mink. Mink. Yeah. And and the value of the mink right now, you can't you can't take the fur unless you have a permit. But it was three hundred and eighty dollars last I checked for a you know well done mink. Health. Now they're raised on farms. 
True. Although people do have still still trap in mm -hmm. certain states. So this this Westfield River that we're going to talk about today was critical for pension making the decision to establish the city of Springfield. It would allow the connection that he needed with the Amerindians out here. Now we got the Adelon, and then a little further west, we're going to have the Tatum, and people argue sometimes the Tatum Indians are probably just a village of the Agawam. You go a little further out, you got the Warnock Indians. And as you move out, you're going to even run into Huzathonic Indians. Uh, what is it called? Pope Pope Dunk? Pope, not Podunk, Pope Dunk. Which are branches. Those are sub-tribes of the Mohican, which you guys know of as the Mohican, last of the Mohicans, right? And they're out in here. So in the anyways, the Westfield River was a road. Give me another clip, Rach, thank you. So here we are, finally, there it is. Notice what it's called on the map. This is a 17, what, 40s map. I don't want to rock. Give it another clip. And now we can see the Westfield River watershed on the left. And the west, and our plan is, we have a plan. After we're done with this talk, our plan is we're going to continue this Thing. We're going to maybe next year we'll do from Huntington to West Springfield. And then the following year we're going to be up. But there's three branches of the Westfield River that all come together in the town of Huntington, which was called Number Nine. That was what it was called originally. Number Nine became Huntington. But that would be the West Branch, the Middle Branch, and finally the East Branch. Was that the Those middle, three middle inspiration for the for the song? Was Number that? nine. I think it might have been Huntington Mass. The Beatles, huge fans of Huntington. Mm -hmm. So now over here, we have one of my favorite maps that I have in my classroom. And this is the map that shows West Springfield after it breaks away from Springfield. West Springfield got its independence. Is Get that ready. Is that Bundy Leonard right there? That ain't. <laughs> He's distracting me. Yes, he's, he's right. It is Bobby's Island. Back when it wasn't an island. When it was an island. That's totally right. So we got to look at this here map and understand that once upon a time, West Springfield was part of Springfield, it got its independence in the year 1774. And we are very close to the 250th anniversary of that. That's pretty cool. It is cool. I'm gonna really I got another three or four years before I retire to be ready, right? Before I retire from teaching. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna make sure the town does a kick ass celebration of our two hundred and fiftieth anniversary. Because we really need to, you know. We I, when I was a kid we celebrated our two hundredth anniversary. So I got great kids and I know they'll help me if I if I put the put the target on the map, you know what I mean? So we're gonna get the schools going, we're going to make it happen. The 250th anniversary of West Virginia, and, and by, you know, by connection, Adelon. You can see Adelon and Holyoke are both part of West Springfield in this town. And there's our Adelon River, and as my brother points out, there's Bondi's Island. You know how you get on Route 5 when you're driving down 5 and you're going to go across that crazy bridge where you might die if you're heading for 91, right? You're going down that road, and you come to the, on Route 5, you're going so fast you're not paying attention. And you come to the sign that says entering Agawam. And, and you're like, wait a minute, where did this border come from? But you can see here that at one point, actually it doesn't even show here, at one point in the mid-19th century, the Western River cut through right here, making a full scale, not the Connecticut, and the Westfield cut. If you look at the Westfield on Google Earth, you'll see there's all kinds of oxbows, you know all those ponds down there by the Big E? There's all those little back ponds. That's from the Westfield River meandering as it gets close to the Connecticut River. And at one point it cut through and that whole piece of land was an island. Anyways, Bondi's Island, which has got its own little history. Maybe the history of Bondi's Island would be something for us to do another day. Do it a quick race. We should make a tour. So, yeah. <laughs> so there it is. We're going even closer. You can see your streets. And, and again, let's get moving. i got to move this thing. So you know that back in 1683 there was a disaster on the Connecticut River. Everybody in West Springfield had to, by law, go to, if you were on the west side of the river, without separation of church and state, you had to cross the Connecticut River to go to church. And going across the river, Reese Baderta with his little granddaughter, Mercy Baderta, who was only a week old, and three other members of the Baderta family, they found themselves flipped over in a boat in the March 
flooded, freezing Connecticut River water. They died. Five right. people. The family's still around. We're back. We're back. We're back. The family's still around. I asked them in my class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're still found in the family. But Dirt, I don't know who Dirt is. Oh, oh, they call me. He said Dirt now. I don't know. They have the. Well, I think it's a Welsh name. If I go back and look. But anyway, 1683, the town petitions the state. The state, the state gives us our own parish as well as Adelaide in 1696, 97. And there's our first two and So we move on. So you can see West Springfield becomes what it becomes because of the river and a tragedy, right? So now here we're looking at Google Earth and we've already been looking at that and I've mapped this out and I've put on this map a whole bunch of archeological sites and that's one of my surprises for you tonight. So if you're into archeology span and Amerindians, you're gonna get something cool here. Give it another click. There's our canoe. We went, I was gonna bring the canoe in here, but I thought I'd have a hard time getting it through the door. I've been in wars with the town library for many years. I used to bring the kids over here to do research, and I would like volunteer to help them. And the head librarian would get mad at me because I'm not a quiet person. <laughs> when, when, when he says he was going to bring it, he means she was going to have me bring it in and direct it. It's a light canoe. It only weighs like 45 pounds, but it's a flat bottom aluminum canoe. Not a like not a canoe that you would see in the canoe races because it's made for fishing. It's very stable, it doesn't flip over, and we figured it would work on the river, and it did. Give it a click, right? So we were getting ready to launch. You can see little George across the street. We're getting ready to launch, and all of a sudden, the West Side PD, your tax money, checking uh, checking out to make sure the basements, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The local ne'er-do-wells didn't cause any trouble. And I, that, that's actually one of uh, one of my former students. Uh, so one three, of three, hours, three hours later, after we officer Price, officer Price, Price. <laughs> officer Price, this was an officer arts when he was checking us out. It was, a, it was, a, and there he is, dressed as he is right now. Notice West Side history teacher coach. He and I both coach uh, West Side wrestling with our other brother. I don't coach so much anymore, but look at him. Look at him. Notice how he's carrying all the fishing poles. Steve, bring the poles down. I was a guy. I did. <laughs> are, these, are these exact same fishing poles? That could be you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Notice I wrote burger. I wrote, he, he's what's considered a master burger, but he didn't want me to write that, so he just wrote I, I, I don't know if you even have a designation master burger. I consider you a master I burger. Know, I appreciate that. Give it a click, right? <laughs> and not me. You can keep clicking. That's number no, no. Now, in the river, we got all kinds of great fish. So we're talking a little bit about the fish, the Connecticut River and the Westfield River. So there's our walleye. Walleye, we're almost gone from the river. Walleye are a real, <laughs> real big sport fish. They're very, very tasty. In Minnesota, this is the fish to eat. They are all over walleye. I'm going to tell you right now, walleye are back big time. When I was in high school back in the 80s, I used to catch little walleye. And I have okay. former students on Facebook and Instagram. They're now in their 30s and 40s, and they're sending me pictures of big walleye that they're catching. So I got a target walleye down there one of these days. If you go out to eat in Minnesota, you go to the restaurants, inevitably you'll see this on the menu. This and wild rice. Yeah, they like the wild they rice. Do. They, they do. They go to the wild, wild rice. That's an Amerindian specialty, right? It is, and, 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 and birds love it too. Yeah. And then we got the largemouth and the smallmouth bass. The Connecticut and the Westfield River are full of those guys, as well as the northern pike and his smaller cousin, the chain pickerel. I've caught northern pike over 10 pounds in the Connecticut River right out in front of West Frankfort. So this big northern pike. And then don't forget our perch, the white perch and the yellow perch. These are called warm water fish. They like the water temperature to be warm. Give it a click, Rach. Now we got our canned fish. There's a whole mess of different kinds of fish that you guys call. Pumpkin seeds or bluegills. Notice I said with my Western Mass accent. Or some pumpkin seed. Pumpkin. I could have said pumpkin seed, but I'm Western Mass, so I said pumpkin seed. Do we have a click rate? <laughs> now we got our trout. Now we didn't grow up with pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a brook trout. This trout is native to the Connecticut and the Westfield River. These two trout are not. The rainbow trout comes from. The uh, Midwest, the wet, more the West than the Midwest, and they were stocked all over the place. And the state of Massachusetts loves stocking them because 
They look good on a plate. Mm. Then there's the brown trout, which get much larger than rainbows generally, and they like warmer water than the rainbow. Most of the trout that the state puts in our rivers in Massachusetts die by August, because they don't have enough oxygen and the water gets too warm. So they're put in the river for fishermen to catch, or some of the wildlife that we'll or talk about. The birds that can be otters just otters get them in. Or bald eagles and hard hair. Hey, all right. These brown trout, they can tolerate warmer water, and they're really the fish to put in our rivers. Anyways, those are our cold water fish called trout. Give it another click. There's an invasive, although two of those trout are invasive. Back in the 1880s, they were stocking carp all over the place because everybody thought that would be a great sport fish. And it is a great sport fish if you know how to catch it. It's just that they're hard to catch. And they get big. I've seen them in the Westville River, right here in West Springfield, that are in the 40 to 45 pound class. They are related, massive. They are related to the goldfish. Yeah, you put them in their little fish tank. And these guys have been around a long time. There is a type of carp that has recently got into America, that jumping carp. Have you ever seen those yeah. jumping carp that when they hear an outboard motor, they jump right out of the river? And people have been killed in power boats because the carp gets startled by the sound and jumps and they, you know, dead. <laughs> but they're not around here. They're out in the, the Midwest, out on the Mississippi and or, Ohio. And, and, and also in the West, too, if you go down to Lake Mead yeah. in Arizona. Tons. They actually have fishing competitions. <laughs> yep, yep. Give it a quick, Rich. Now we got what are called rough species. So here's your brown bullhead, and there is your blue channel cat. These are in large numbers available in the Connecticut River. Up top is a fish that most people would call a dace, but it's not a dace, it's called a fall fish. Beautiful, fun fish to catch, and if you catch, people catch dace, I don't know why people do this, but they'll throw them up on the bank, and they, they shouldn't do that. Let them go. That date, that fall fish right there, though, is a beautiful fish, and it needs really clean water. When you get those in a river, you know the river's coming back. The uh, below that is the uh, longnose gar, and that is a prehistoric fish. You know you touch most fish, and you will feel the slime on the fish. If you touch a gar, it's like you're touching a snake. They don't have slime, so they're really different, and they're really they don't need much oxygen in the water at all. So those ponds down by the big eating ray could very well have gar in there. You actually see these over in Stanley Park. Yeah, yeah, they're in Stanley Park, right. You see them gulping, well, yeah. gulping air off the top. And you'll see them, they're, they're huge. I caught them up on Lake Champlain. I caught one of those about four and a half feet long. And the thing about it is I, I caught it in a canoe. So bringing it into a canoe is a whole different place. And that is one of my favorite fish. Really ugly, and people think that it's one of those snakeheads. It looks like a snakehead. If you look up a snakehead, which are invasive from China that have gotten into American water. That looks like one, but that's called a bowfin. That's natural. It's another prehistoric fish, really cool fish to run into around here. They're very powerful and fun to catch. Give it a quick rage. Now we got our sturgeon. Do you know that we have sturgeon in our rivers? Three different kinds of sturgeon. Short nose, the, the green sturgeon, and then the Atlantic sturgeon. They just follow these floating dead down in the heart for two years ago. Yeah, two years ago. By the way, these are your older things she was talking about. Yeah. You see these, these scoops, which are all bone. So they were yeah. like old fish. Like an exoskeleton. Yeah, they had, they had these big bony plates on them. And this is one of the remnants of these guys. Yeah, huge, like a dinosaur. Huge I had one of those on in Lake Champlain one time and then I didn't land it. They're, they're not sure. About five feet long. They're not sure how, how, how long they live, nor how big they grow. There's reports in the Danube River by the Romans who were not telling fish tales of regular catches of 30 meter long, 30 meter long surgery, which would suggest that they've been reverse evolutionized. Like what happened was they harvested too many big ones, meaning that the smaller genetics were then handed on, handed down. Or they're just but that would be the biggest fish on the planet. Yeah. They got to be. Or they just don't get long. that big anymore because they're fish. Right, right, because they're keeping the big ones, is that? Yep. Or because, like you say, they don't know how old they live. Yep. Give it a quick, right? And there, here's our, here's the subject of the, the real subject. When we start talking about the Amerindians and why the Amerindians love West Springfield, Agawam, the riverine systems that I'm talking about, the Chickie River, it's because of these fish. So think about how bad it would have been to be an Amerindian in March. You're so hungry that you are going to take a stone implement and drill a hole in a maple or a birch tree to collect the sap that you're going to then boil for hours in a wooden vessel quite often. 
to get yourself some syrup that would give you some calories. There's how bad they, you know, if you're thinking about the native people of the Northeast, the starving time. If you met an Amerindian in October, they're described as being kind of chubby. But by the time you get to March, they're tightening their belts. So or they didn't, they didn't, didn't store Hurting off their loins. Right. They didn't have. They, didn't, they did not. No. No. They didn't salt. No. They very rarely smoked. They generally ate it all. And they basically got chubby. And then when the winter came, they slowly starved. So when these things came back in the river, it was all bets are off. I think back in the river, because these guys are, all these guys are migratory, so they spend most of their lives in the ocean and they breed in fresh water. So they come up all over the sea. We all know about salmon doing that. Well, these guys right here, the, the allies and the herring and the shad, the American shad, and then finally the Atlantic salmon. Now, when I was a kid, biologists thought that there, were, that there was a huge salmon run in the Connecticut River. And the federal government spent billions of dollars trying to restore the Atlantic salmon to the Connecticut River. And at the present, many biologists are saying that they think it might be a little too far south for there to have been huge numbers of them. There, salmon, here, we have salmon in the records. But we don't have huge numbers of salmon in the records. When you read Civil War letters, like I, I was going to bring them and I forgot. I left them in that crazy drawer with all my stuff. I have in your records in your of a uh, Civil War soldier from Adelon actually lived on the, the midnight, in the Midnight neighborhood. Actually, I can't remember the guy's name. The guy won the Congressional Medal of Honor. He's, he's buried. Yeah, yeah, he's buried up in Holyoke, right? Right on the... Yeah. yeah. That guy wrote a letter to his wife in May of 1864 when he was at the Battle of the Wilderness. So he's got a little bit of downtime in this five day long battle over Bobby Lee's attack and having which went from Sunday. And he's writing a letter saying to his wife, he wishes that he had a slice of her shad pie. And this connects me as I'm reading these letters. People will bring these Civil War letters to transcribe because they're written in real flowery English and there's a lot of shop talk in them. And when I read that letter, I just it immediately connected me to my river, the Westville River, and I thought, oh, 150 years ago, some guy was doing the same kind of thing that I was doing myself as a young guy, right? I don't so, know. Chef, huh? I've never had a chef. I've never eaten a chef. I just got to let them go. But I, I'm enjoying So there's your American chef. They get to weigh up to 11 pounds. They're generally four or five pounds. And uh, then your, your herring, which are now endangered. You know, this, this fish, for some reason, they think that they're getting uh, netted in the Atlantic, and uh, there's a demand for herring in the Scandinavian countries and in Japan. And of course, that's the story of fish in this world, right? Nobody really protests about fish. You know, you get you get all fired up about dolphins, but not fish. Until and they're and, almost gone. Until they're almost gone. Uh, so oh, yeah, the population crash, and it just seems like the way of the world. It's very sad to me, but let's continue, Rachel, give it another click. And there's our famous Palindromous fish, right? But he does the opposite. He goes from freshwater, where he spends most of his life, down into the ocean to spawn. And there's your eel. How many of you guys have ever eaten eel? Hey, nobody in the room's eating eel. I'm glad you've eaten eel. And if you go to a, uh, a, a Japanese restaurant, you get don. unagi don, which is one of my favorite things. Eel is very delicate. And a lot of my Italian friends from West Springfield would eat eel during the Christmas season. I guess it's tradition, but it's good to me, believe me. One of the things that's lost here today, and you saw on the, the, the slide, is an animal called a mud puppy. Lot of them? One of the longest, one of the largest amphibians yeah. in the world that is found right in the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. And most people don't even know it. Yeah, you want to try it. In fact, it's not even found in New York. Yeah, once in a while, one of the kids will catch one. Yep. They'll be fishing for pumpkin seeds and they'll catch a mud puppy that long and they, cut, and they look like a monster. Yeah, they're about three and a half feet long. Kids get scared. Of me. I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> and last, we have uh, stripers. These are these are these are ocean fish. They come into the Connecticut River in April, May, June, and they come in following the herring and the shad and the alewives, and they're trying to eat them. They're not playing around. And it's probable that the striper return, there's a real rejuvenation in the striper population that started the 90s, went, went into a little bit of a tailspin, and now it's coming back. These guys eat a lot of fish. 
and they may have contributed to the decline in herring numbers, but you can see that the pool bust out on Long Island Sound last year with these, they're typically a saltwater fish. We caught them at the same time. It's so, it was a school day too, we went after school day. I told you I was gonna catch something. <laughs> so now when you launch your canoe on the, I mean, on the Westfield River, the first thing you will see, just, this is right behind the Russian church, or the Sonoka. You watch your canoe, you immediately go, am I in West Springfield? Because it is absolutely beautiful. The smell of the water, the sound of the cicadas, and the, the birds and the trees, right? It, it's just pristine. You feel like you're alone in the universe, but you've got Route 20. And you know it, because you can hear it. Beyond that, it's just gorgeous. So we, we start here, give it another quick rage, and he immediately identifies the Reverend Blackbird. Do the song. Do the call. Do the call. I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm serious. This, this bird, by the way, is the first bird to migrate back in the area. We all think that everything shows up as now, or maybe in, in, in a week or a few weeks earlier. This guy shows up in mid February or early February. I'm telling my wife this year. Reverend Blackbird should be showing up any day now, probably tomorrow. Next day, ah, they were there. That was, I think, February 10th. Yeah, there they are. Are. And the female is nothing like it. Nothing. So no, really he was this out. The female was like a sparrow. I thought it was a sparrow. But a bigger sparrow. <laughs> bigger than a sparrow. We're going to throw this out. Right? Ugly sparrow. Just so you know. This so, is called. But they have a very expressive voice. Their call is beautiful. Yeah, lots of lots calls. Lots this, of is called, this is called mm -hmm. sexual dimorphism. In other words, the female and the male look very different. You, you, only, you don't see this with a lot of birds, but with all of our summer birds, you do. The sexual dimorphism. Most birds will mark their territory by calling. So he says, call for it. I told you he's doing it. But one of the things that he does when he's calling is he takes his wings and flares them out. Call for it. He flares them out. And when he does, his muscles pull open this thing called epaulette, so you see this big red and yellow flash. It's scary. Or normally they're kind of thin. You don't see them as much. They're not trying to scare them off. What they're trying to do is establish a territory. So they go around and do this. And some sick researcher, because researchers are sick, some sick researcher decided, is it the call or is it the epaulette? Is it the call or is it the epaulette that allows these birds to hold on to a territory? So they took, the, they took these male red and blackers and they painted their epaulets black and they let them go. And they found out that it wasn't so much their call, but the flash of the epaulet that kind of said to all the other males, I'm pretty dominant, I got these massive epaulets, don't come near me. Look at him go. go. This is why the kids love his class. You know? <laughs> He's got this bird class he does with the kids, it's crazy. Anyways. So Anthony's going to bring around raffle tickets. They're free, so she's just going to, while we're doing our thing, she's just going to distribute the raffles. Give it a quick, Rach. Oh, Louie Land. Now, this is, I took, I pulled these pictures from the video. They, they're much clearer. I, like, zoomed in and it kind of blurred it. But that is the first thing I found. Literally, I got in the, in the canoe. Give it a quick, again, Rach. And what we're looking at here are freshwater mussels, right? Not, not edible. Not edible if you're smart, because you can get sick. Yeah, right? and the sick you also get worms and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're hungry enough, I guess. I guess. Right? But the point is, those guys are used for lots of things. Like, Amerindians would use those for scraping hides. So if you kill the mink and you wanted to get all the flesh off the pelt, you'd scrape it. You'd use them as knives. They're very, very sharp. Believe it or not, most of them are endangered. And these are called creepers. And you can tell because they got this real like octagonal cut right there. The Westville River is one of like 20 towns in Massachusetts that actually has them. Westville River between Westfield, well, I, I, there are several towns on the Westfield that have them. But West Springfield is full of them. Like if you go over the dike and down into the sand on the other side of the dike in the summer, there's mussels all over the place. Some of them are very, very large. So, anyways, that's a cool species to run into right away. Now, here we are in the canoe going down the river. I have my drone with me. We got some drone shots. Yep, give it another quick race. And we went up the river a little ways, and we went behind the big one, the, 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 the car wash. Back in 1983, I was going to Westville State College. And I'm an observant young guy. I'm always looking at the river. 
I like it. It makes me think about fishing even in the winter. And I will ice fish too. And I'm looking in the river one day and I see this circle of ice, right? And over the years I noticed that the circle of ice starts like a bottle cap in the center of a whirlpool. I've been putting pictures of this up on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and stuff for years. And I've had the most funny responses. Is there a UFO down there, Savak? What's down there? And I get all this stuff. And it's just a little circle of ice forms. And the conditions got to be right. The river's got to be the right height. It's got to be the right temperature. Can't get too cold too quick. And it starts forming as a little bottle cap. Pretty soon it's as big as a trash can lid. And then it gets so big, as you can see here, it fills the entire pool. You give it a click, you can see some drone footage now. It's going to open up. Click on that and it should open up, I think. And uh, yeah, you can see that it's just a minute long, so I'll shut up and you can watch it. Because I, I ran out of high school during a prep period a couple of years ago with Mr. Wright. I, yeah, I took off. I didn't tell the principal I was going. He would have said no. Never ask. <laughs> Always say I'm sorry, but don't ask. Right? Don't ask if you can ask forgiveness. I'm so, so sorry. Oh. So, see how beautiful that is? Now, if you see that at the right time, it'll be spinning really slowly. I've got video of it spinning. So, if you're going down 20, coming back from Walmart, and you see a truck at the, like, the car wash pulled half into the parking lot, it's probably me getting video of my ring of ice. Which, you might have saw in Maine, they got a ring of ice a couple years ago. I have been videotaping my ring of ice now for 20 years. I got nothing. I even sent it to Channel 22, the dirty dogs didn't put it on. They let some maze, nothing happened to me. I said, you got a ring of ice, it's the biggest thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rick, you can start